Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm Tony Mason and I'm going to have another of our chats and this time we're going to talk about the Border Reavers. For almost 400 years, from the early 14th century, families of the English and the Scottish borders fought. A series of endless raids and reprisals. It was said about the border reavers that if Jesus Christ were amongst them, they would deceive him. Having said that, um, there were codes and laws which they abided by. If you were an Armstrong, a Bell, a Byrne, a Charlton, a Crozer, an Elliot, a Fenwick, Foster, Graham, Hall, Hetherington, Hume, Irvine, Johnson, Kerr, Maxwell, Musgrave, Nixon, Robson, Scott or Story, then this is about your family tree. If you know some of these people, or if you have people in your family who have this surname, then there is probably a direct link and descendancy to the Border Reavers. There are other names. Noble is one, for example. So how many people do you know? Or how many shops have you seen? Um, for example, in Langham, uh, the Graham Arms is there. Um, and Lord and Lady Graham are in residence somewhere nearby. So have a think. How many people have you come across or have you seen or did you go to school with who have names belonging to the original border weaver? Now unfortunately Tully House is closed at the moment um, due to the uh, lockdown that we are experiencing for the third time. So normally uh, we would have been in Tully House and we would have been able to show you uh, some items like a steel bonnet um, or perhaps a jack, which was a type of um, protective leather jerkin, um, or perhaps a sword or two. But unfortunately, we don't have any of those. These were the most notorious reaver riding surnames. And what we're going to look at is a, a brief potted history as to why they came about and how they came about. Um, around about 1250, um, a gentleman called William Rufus, who was in charge of Carlisle Castle, which had been built by then, um, took Cumberland back from the Scots. And he set out the laws of the marches. Basically, um, there was going to be a sheriff on each side of the border, in the west, the middle, and the east sides of the border between England and Scotland. So you had six wardens in total, and these guys, along with their deputies, would keep peace, and they would settle disputes between families and between the borders. So in effect, you would have a day of truce. And we'll come back to this day of truce in the future. Towards the end of the, the Reva uh, times, which spanned, as I said, four, 400 years, this ended round about the time of the accession of James I of England, fourth of Scotland, when effectively Elizabeth I died. And he basically but we will come as to exactly how he did that in a moment. Um, we're going to have a little look now as to exactly what the borders, where they were. Well, basically, they ran from Edinburgh, house to Newcastle, and a little bit further south than that, in the east, encompassing Berwick on the coast, and then across to the west-hand side to Carlisle, 
and into the Eden Valley and up over the border to um, Jedbra and also into the west to Dumfries. Um, it was a, an area of 4,000 square kilometres of wild and unhospitable lands. Um, what we're going to find is, is that these people actually brought a lot of the trouble to themselves. However, um, a lot of it was caused by warring kings of both England and Scotland who um, were constantly at each other's throats over this time and would use the borderers to prick and uh, harry the enemy. Um, and consequently, it was very much like um, what you might find in the American West. You would have little outposts of um, law, like say Carlisle Castle, um, and the rest would be probably um, um, quite lawless. Um, people would carry their own weapons, and um, you, you have to be on your guard. Um, people would go reaving, and that's where we get the word to be bereaved from. And they also brought uh, another um, word into the English language of blackmail, because basically they would charge rent, blackmail, to a farmer in order to um, keep him safe, shall we say. A bit like something that the uh, Chicago Mafia used to do, um, and th there were similarities between the two institutions. Um, let's have a little look inside this map. George MacDonald Fraser wrote, quite possibly, I'll show you this down here, that's the book, and it's called The Steel Bonnets, and it's a fascinating book. Um, he wrote the uh, sharp books, sorry, correction. He didn't write the sharp books, he wrote the Flashman books. But he was um, related and married to a Graham. And he was very, very interested in the history of this. And he wrote in his book, which is a seminal work on the Border Reavers, this. The Border Reaver is a figure unique in British and perhaps world history. A professional cattle thief who left to posterity a legacy of great poetry, which we'll see later. He was a merciless racketeer and plunderer who was also the country's vanguard in time of war. A murderous pursuer, a feud who held little sacred except his pledged word and who vanished four centuries ago, leaving behind the word blackmail and a bloodline which is included amongst others, presidents, Sir Walter Scott, the Charlton brothers who played football, Rutherford the physicist, Billy Graham the evangelist, Robert Burns, actresses, Deborah Kerr and T.S. Eliot, and also the first man on the moon who was an Armstrong. So quite an eclectic mix of people have travelled through the centuries with the Reavers. If we go back to that, if we go back to what it must have been like in those times, you basically had names of families that we've talked about. And these were basically led by what was the head man, um, or the godfather, if you like. Um, and at one stage, in um, towards the end of the border times, um, Johnny Armstrong could put possibly 2,000 men in, on horseback in a raid, which is quite something when you think about it. Um, it was a bit like Dodge City, Tombstone, these kind of lawless places that we've seen in Westerns, in the American West, um, a lot of places in the borders were lawless. 
so much so that in 1523, the Archbishop of Glasgow cursed them. I'm going to read you a little bit of the curse because 400, 500 years later, the Carlisle City Council, in their infinite wisdom, decided it would be a good idea to bring this cursing stone to Carlisle um, and commissioned an artist to set it up. So, what exactly did this gentleman have to say? So this is an extract from the Archbishop of Glasgow's monition on cursing, which is when he cursed the border reavers. It's over 500 words long and I'm not going to go into it, but just to give you an idea of the most comprehensive excommunications of all time. And he says, I curse the head and all the hairs on their head. I curse their face, the nose, their mouth, their tongue, their teeth their shoulders, their heart, their stomach, their back, their legs, their hands and their feet. I curse them going and I curse them riding. I curse them standing and I curse them sitting. I curse them by drinking and I curse them walking. And finally, I condemn them perpetually to the deep pit of hell to remain with Lucifer and all his fellows and that their bodies to be put on the gallows and to this terrible cursing and may satisfaction and penance. Can you imagine a Christian vicar actually putting that together for, oh, for some of the gadabouts today? I don't think so. So obviously it was a bit of a it was a bit of a hard time in the borders that um, they actually had. One of the Lord's uh, chosen ones actually giving up this curse. And you'll find that cursing stone near Tully House, between Tully House and Carlisle Castle. We talked about the days of truce. These were when, from sunrise to sunset, anybody who had attended a day of truce on the border to settle bills or to have any um, cases read against them by the warden or to, was called to attend these was basically, how should we say, they were free for that day. Well, one day in round about 1596, a certain Kinmont Willie, who was a notorious freebooter, cattle thief of many years standing, was making his way home from a trust day, from a truce day. And the deputy warden of Carlisle Castle and his men decided they would break the truce and capture said Kinmont and take him to Carlisle Castle, which they duly did. This caused a diplomatic incident, frankly, between Elizabeth I and James IV of Scotland. And letters were sent back and forth demanding the fair release of the said Kinmont by the Lord of the Western English March in Carlisle Castle. Nothing was done for a couple of months, so consequently, the Duke, the bold Duke of Buccleuch and some men formed basically what was a commando unit and with help from the Grahams uh, who uh, helped them open a gate from the inside stormed Carlisle Castle and on April 13th on a stormy night forded the River Eden probably where Bits Park is now and freed Kinmont 
and he went home. Queen Elizabeth I was incandescent with rage. How dare these people assault her border fortress and set free this man, who rightfully should have been set free anyway, but it caused an almighty international incident. Let's not forget that James IV of Scotland was Elizabeth's nominated heir. She had no children to pass the English throne on, and it was agreed that James would come down from Scotland and find her death to take over the English crown. And this was only five years before good Queen Bess, as she was known, actually did that. It just shows how well planned and how well executed this was that no one was hurt um, no one was injured and that the border reavers assaulted what was basically the most impregnable fort and castle in the whole of the borderlands um, so the hold of the clue um, was uh, did very well for himself because many years later when James of England and Scotland was pacifying the border lands he used uh, the bold Buclew to uh, round up a lot of um, the border beavers and basically um, he used a thief to catch a thief. Basically, after the death of Elizabeth in 1603, um, there was a, a lot of raiding and a lot of reaving all the way across the border, and that's why James really had to put his foot down. And in the next 10 to 15 years, he deported many of the uh, notorious reaver, reaver families. Um, some went to the Low Countries in the army, um, some were planted in Ireland, um, that's where the plantations came from. Um, they were actually forcibly sent there, um, lock, stock and barrel, um, and some of them ended up uh, in future years going to America, Australia, and spreading out throughout the world because they were forcibly removed from the borderlands. Some were captured, imprisoned, some, some were hung some were just deported. It was basically uh, a clearance um, of the type that later happened in the Highlands. Um, so we're going to have a bit of poetry now. And this is a modern poem on the Border Reavers. Um, this is one of the very best of the modern poems about the Border Reavers. Um, written by a gentleman called W.H. Ogilvy himself for the name of that is in the border can and he says last night a wind from Lanamure came roaring up the glen with a tramp of horses hooves and a laugh of reckless men and struck a mailed hand on the gate and cried in rebel glee come forth come forth my borderer and ride the march with me I said O oh, wind of Lanamure that night's too dark to ride, and all the men that fell the glen are ghosts of men that died. The floods are down on Beaumont Burn, the moss is fetlock deep. Go back, wild man of Lanamure, to Lauderdale and sleep. Outspoke the wind of Lanamure, we know the road right well. The road that runs by Cale and Jed and across the Carter Fell. There is no man in all the men in this great troop of mine but blind might ride the border side from TV at head to time. The horses fretted on their bits and poured the flints to fire. The riders swung them to the south, full faced in their desire. Come, said the wind from Lanamure, and spoke scornfully, Have you no pride to mount and ride your father's road with me? A horse to the gate they fled, Foam flecked and travelled far, a snorting roan that tossed his head 
and flashed his forehead star. Then came the sound of clashing steel and a hoof tramp up the glen, and two by two we cantered through a troop of ghostly men. I know not if the farms we fired are burned to ashes yet. I know not if the Sturks grew tired before the stars were set. I only know that late last night when northern winds blew free, a troop of men rode up the glen, but a horse. That gives an idea of what it might be like if you take yourself out when the moon is full and when the cattle are full, which is basically after the harvest, October, November time. Um, that's why they call it a hunter's moon. Um, and those days, as the nights were growing longer and darker, after the harvest, October, November and into December, were the ones that people in the borders feared the worst. But what about these border reavers? Well, basically they had a pony, or a Galloway nag, or a hobby as they called them. Um, and they were much prized, these horses. Um, the border reavers were very fond of horse racing. And if you go to Tully House, you will see that there are a couple of um, horse prizes from those uh, times and they're called bells and they were given uh, to the winners little silver bells and they're actually still run for at Carlisle races the Carlisle Bell is one of if not the oldest horse race in the United Kingdom um, and it was at one of these horse race meetings in Carlisle that the plan was put together um, to get him on Willie out of Carlisle Castle. The horses were stolen when they could, they were much prized, and on their back, they were only about 14, 14 and a half hands high, they weren't big horses, not like the gallopers that you would see in the Knights of Old. These were horses who knew every little glance um, of every little fell. Um, and, as said in the poem, could make their own way home. Um, a reaver would have a lance, he would have a, a jack, um, uh, which would be a leather padded garment. He may have a breastplate, may not, uh, may have had a sword with the lance. Latterly would have a couple of pistols. Um, the jack was a protective jacket. Um, and it may have, as I said, had a breastplate on top of it. Um, the English were so concerned about horse trading between the countries that they controlled the sale of horses betwixt England and Scotland. I'm not sure how successful they were. Um, if you go to Newcastleton, um, you are at the forefront of the Liddesdale Valley and that was the major valley of the Border River. Um, if you think about the outlaws in um, the American West, you had the Hole in the Wall Gang which was um, people like um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, people like that. Liddesdale was where the Reavers had their hole in the wall gang. Um, Newcastleton was a name given to the town that was put there by the Victorians. Originally it was called Copshaw Hole. Um, and what was interesting about that, you had particularly the Elliots lived around there with the Armstrong. The interesting thing about the Elliots was that they were purportedly to be cack-handed. That's lefties, left-handed. And their peeled towers, which I'll explain about them in a moment, and show you a photograph of, um, were, um, they had the stairs going round in an opposite manner so that their sword hand was free from the wall. So they could fight with much freedom. 
if they were on a staircase. Whereas someone with a right hand was permanently hitting the wall. There's a photograph there, down on the camera, of a peel tower or a bastel house. And these were um, on the ground floor was where the, the owner put his cattle, sheep, anything else. And they would go there in the winter as well and obviously provide feeding upstairs for people. But in times of strife, if the readers were reavers were riding, you could lock them in there and then retire upstairs. One notorious place in the Liddesdale Valley, and I'm going to show you this photograph here, is Hermitage Castle. Hermitage Castle had already been around before the Reavers, um, around about 1250, it was first mentioned, and um, it's a very, very, very scary place, actually. Um, it's well worth going to have a look at. If you stand opposite it on the roadside, about everything you see was still there as it would have been 500 years ago. Um, it has no roof, um, it's uninhabited, um, you can visit. Um, it was originally uh, the home of the Black Douglas, uh, and before that, apparently, by a man called De Solis, who um, the locals didn't take to him. Um, they thought, well, he did, actually, by all accounts to the locals, practice uh, black magic. And um, um, when the crops and the cattle um, didn't um, live or grow for a couple of years, for a couple of seasons, they promptly um, um, rolled them in lead and boiled them in oil. It's definitely worth going to get an, uh, going to visit to get an idea of what it must have been like to be out in that valley with the weaver. Um, There is also another place not far from Carlisle, not far from Langham, um, um, which is called the Debatable Lands. And we'll show you an area on the map exactly where that is. Um, it was basically no man's land, or free land, or debatable land. It wasn't Scott or it wasn't English. Um, no buildings were allowed to be put up there, but if you were in trouble, or if you were a broken man, or if you're on the run from <laughs> what the, the warden and his deputies, you could go there without fear, um, because there were no laws of the marches for England or Scotland in that area. So here we have uh, a map of the borderlands. Um, to the top we have Edinburgh, obviously the capital of Scotland, Newcastle upon Tyne, Berwick upon Tweed, coming across from Newcastle, Carlisle, and then over the border you've got Dumfries here, and other places we've talked about, um, we have, there's Hermitage. Hermitage, as you can see, is just over the Scottish border, but it was actually manned by troops from the Warden of Carlisle Castle. Now to go to, from Hermitage to Carlisle was a day's horse ride. It took a day to ride from there to there. But Hermitage was known as the cockpit of the border. And basically, when we talked about the Wild West and um, forts, that was basically very similar. In fact, that is where Mary Queen of Scots went to for rescue. And then, of course, she was taken to Carlisle Castle where she stayed for a few months before Elizabeth had her transferred further down to England. Penrith here, obviously. Lots of raiding down into the Eden Valley. Lots of raids across 
into Northumberland and obviously there's the Carter Bar which we talked about in the pool. Um, Berwick. Berwick changed hands about 14 times between the English and the Scots um, but was obviously um, a major player in the, the, the uh, eastern side of the marches there. Um, and Norm Castle here is a fantastic um, example of a field tower um, and it actually is surrounded by water practically anyway obviously um, you've got Loch Maven Castle here um, the Maxwells and the Johnsons um, fought had a running battle had a blood feud for well, about 150 years between the pair of them and it was basically over who was going to be the Scottish Sheriff. Um, there was um, a big battle between the Johnsons and the Maxwells um, in which it was called the Lockerbie Lick and basically the Johnsons rode through on horseback when they knew that the Johnsons were going to be around in Lockerbie and basically the Lockerbie Lick was the slash of the sword um, on the, on the backs of their heads and their backs as they were riding through on their horses. Um, this area here, that straight line there and round about these areas was all debatable lands here. Um, and in fact that, that straight line was actually put in um, after a, a, a commission between the English and the Scottish and the French who were um, friends of the Scottish but they acted as honest brokers because nobody could decide on you where the border went. Obviously this is the border line here which goes all the way up to the east coast whereas Hadelands of course comes all the way along here. Um, up here, round here you have the Devil's Beat Pub and basically this is where reavers would take cattle and, and, and hide it basically in, in a hidden valley um, so you can see all these little marks were where there were peeled towers and obviously in this valley here um, going up towards where Kielder Water is um, there's lots of activity around here of course Kielder Water wasn't here uh, that's a man-made reservoir um, which only came about in the latter half of the 20th century um, so there were ra raids from the Scottish side over to the English side. But you can see there's a lot of... This is the Liddersdale Valley going up here. Basically, the, you're so far out of reach if it's a two days ride to get from Carlisle to Newcastle. And if you didn't know the country, then uh, you were in serious trouble. Um, and here you have the border towns of Hoyek and Gallas Shields, Jedburgh, um, and uh, obviously the abbeys, Elso Abbey, and uh, other places. So there's a lot of history in and around this area. Um, and uh, I'll just show you this down here. That basically shows where the names were predominantly in and around the borderline. All of this came to an end in about 1610, 1615, when, as I say, um, the borderers, reavers, were rounded up and either executed, imprisoned, um, or sent away to other lands far, far away. Um, and just on a final note, if you look in the telephone directory in Ireland um, for the Mahogs, um, you'll find that that is a spelling of Graham backwards. Um, the Grahams particularly um, were um, thought to be um, right for moving on from the, uh, from the border. Um, and, uh, but yet we find, as we know, they are in Longtown still, so it didn't necessarily work. The Border Reavers, worth investigating. Thank you.